I heard on the radio that it was announced that this year, the last year, was the hottest on record. And I was reminded that we have a long-term pandemic, if you will, of our state being on fire because of the pollution that causes climate change. And that while we are dealing with this immediate pandemic, we have a longer one that we must attack to preserve the health of our state and our children and our grandchildren. And that's to fight against carbon pollution in our state. So today I'm announcing a series of measures associated with our budget to attack carbon pollution head on. And there's a good reason or several reasons for it. We are an anti-pollution state we are a pro-jobs state, we are a pro-healthcare state, and we are a pro-science state. And today I'm announcing a series of measures by attacking carbon pollution. We will honor all of those basic values of the state of Washington, including growing our economy big time across the state of Washington. And I look forward to discussing this package with you. Uh, these proposals that I'm uh, making today are comprehensive, they are robust, and they are pro appropriately ambitious because they're intending to meet or come very close to meeting our goals that have been statutorily codified by the last legislative session. And we have done some really good work in our state already. But it is clear that we need to move forward with these strong steps if we're going to meet our legislatively adopted requirements in our moral obligation to ourselves and our grandchildren. Uh, and we know that we can do this while we grow our economy. We already have 90,000 plus clean energy jobs in our state, and that number is continuing to grow rapidly. The top four categories in clean energy jobs are all in the building sector, meaning jobs for carpenters and engineers and many other professions in our construction and transportation industries. So the policies we're announced today are based both in a respect for our health and our environment, but they are also based on economic principles and scientific principles. And our state has been successful in so many decades because we've embraced both concepts. We honor science rather than ignoring it, and we recognize a good deal when we see one so that we can grow what has been one of the best economies in the United States. So we can fight climate change and we can create good paying jobs by transitioning to a cleaner energy economy. We know these actions are required now. This is not something we can put off. We just cannot kick this can down the road anymore. Communities like Walla Walla have suffered historic flooding that I saw uh, last year. Along our coast, our economies are being impacted both by rising sea levels, where we're having to move sometimes whole communities, and ocean acidification is imperiling our fishing industry and our shellfish industry, both in Puget Sound and in our coastline. I saw firsthand the impact of fires in Malden uh, this last summer, where 80% of the buildings in the town burned down, people's homes and businesses of a town that had been there for a long time, destroyed by these raging climate fires that we know with scientific certainty are made more intense and more frequent by these climate-generated uh, uh, fires. The changing climate makes those things worse and many other things in our lives. So the time to act is now. We cannot wait, and this is a fork in the road and we're gonna take one to healthy, healthier communities. And people's tolerance for inaction is, is, is gone. Uh, people are exhausted having to deal with these climate emergencies because we know that these trends will not reverse themselves on their own. We have to take action. And like COVID, climate change is something that is or can be and should be and must be under our control. We have the tools to defeat COVID we're going to use them, and we will. And we have the, the tools to defeat climate change, and we will, because we believe in science. Now, as far as the necessity of taking action, I'd like to share our current status in the state of Washington. Uh, this is a graph 
that the green line shows our historic emissions level of, of, of pollution. And uh, if we adopt the current status quo and make no further changes this year, the projected existing is in the light blue line. That's what we're, we would intend to see as pollution amounts if we do not change our policies. The bad news, even though we've reduced our emissions to some degree, as you see, the red line depicts the reductions that are required to meet our state limits of 50 million uh, metric tons by 2030. So we can see that our legislature has passed a law appropriately committing us to our grandchildren and our children to reduce our emissions level by the red line. But we have to get much lower in order to meet those commitments. So if we look at the next graph to show what we're proposing to do by this package, the, uh, the bar on the left shows our current emissions level of 84 million metric tons. We're proposing to reduce that down to 54.2 million metric tons uh, by 2030. And we believe that the package of things we're proposing will be able to meet that reduction, which is significant, meaningful, and absolutely necessary if we're gonna maintain a healthy Washington state in the decades uh, to come. So this would represent a 35% 30, reduction in our current projections. And these are investments in the most beautiful state in the country, with the most promising economy in the country, with the most scientifically literate people in the country, and one that we're not going to give up on. So we know uh, some realities on how to get this job done. We cannot get on top of climate change unless we address the biggest sources, obviously, of pollution. And we know that transportation is the single uh, largest source of greenhouse gas pollution in our state. It composes about 45% of our total pollution emissions level. And despite the fact that cleaner fuels already exist and can be and are being produced right here in Washington, the fossil fuel industry so far has stood in the way of implementation of a clean fuel standard to require us to have cleaner fuels. And if we don't break the industry's control over policymaking, we'll be left with a planet that cannot sustain most of humanity. So I am again proposing that we join the rest of the West Coast in adopting a clean fuel standard. This common sense policy requires fuel suppliers to reduce the amount of carbon emissions from their fuels by 10% by 2028, and by 20% by 2035, and further reductions to meet our 2050 limits. And the way this works is by creating a market for cleaner fuels like biofuels, renewable diesel, and clean electricity for transportation. This policy will reduce emissions by 4 million metric tons when fully implemented by 2035, with negligible impacts on fuel pricing. To further reduce emissions from our transportation system, I am proposing significant investments in clean energy, which will create many more jobs. I'd like to talk about one of them that I think epitomizes what we're capable of doing in our state. As indicated on this chart, our ferries are the biggest generator of emissions in the state's transportation fleet. So my budget includes funding for a new hybrid electric ferry, conversion of an existing ferry to hybrid electric, and construction of three vessel charging terminals. We are already in the process of electrifying one of our state ferries, and that's a great start, but we must do more. Each one of these uh, conversions can reduce 16,340 tons of CO2 emissions per year. And we know that these investments not only cut emissions, but they save up to $14 million on ferry operating costs, obviously principally in fuel, while virtually eliminating their noise and vibration of Puget Sound that's known to harm orcas. And each new ferry would, would create 560 family wage jobs directly and another 890 um, indirectly. And this is just one of the, the many, many projects that we intend to build in our state to create jobs in a clean energy economy. So we intend to get started. 
So uh, to discuss the clean fuel standard a bit more, I'm joined by Representative Joe Fitzgibbon, um, who has been an incredible leader in this effort in our state legislature, uh, to address that a bit further. Uh, Joe. Thank you, Governor. Um, I think uh, the, the most important sector of emissions in Washington State, the largest sector uh, in which we are contributing the greatest amount to the climate pollution problems that the governor described that are exacerbating extreme weather events, uh, exacerbating wildfires, uh, is our transportation sector. Um, of all of the sectors of emissions in our state, transportation constitutes uh, about 40 to 45 percent of Washington State's emissions, making it more than twice as much as the emissions that uh, that our state emits from the electricity sector. Uh, the powerful tool that is already in place in our neighboring jurisdictions of British Columbia, Oregon, and California is a clean fuel standard, which requires that the producers of transportation fuels reduce the carbon output of those fuels over time. Um, this is a uh, policy that is tried and true. It has been very successful in all of our peer jurisdictions on the West Coast. Um, meanwhile, Washingtonians are in, in many cases producing fuel to supply those markets in Oregon, in British Columbia, in California, but we're not getting the clean air benefits because when these fuels, when cleaner fuels, whether that's renewable natural gas or cellulosic ethanol, or electricity used to power our vehicles is used in transportation in place of gasoline and diesel. Not only are we reducing the climate pollution outputs um, from those fuels, we're also reducing um, the local air pollutants that harm human health, whether that's fine particulate matter that causes asthma and other respiratory ailments, whether that's carbon monoxide, which increases infant mortality and maternal mortality, whether that's benzene, which is a carcinogen, um, we're also reducing the output of those pollutants when we transition from gasoline and diesel refined out of fossil fuels to cleaner fuels that are produced uh, from, from things that we actually produce right here in Washington state. So we can improve the air quality in some of the most polluted communities in our states, which are disproportionately uh, communities populated by black and brown Washingtonians who suffer the worst impacts of that harmful air pollution. We can also invest in rural economies throughout Washington state. The rural economies, rural manufacturing, rural agriculture, rural timber jobs, because those are the sectors that produce the feedstocks that we need in order to generate the clean fuels uh, to achieve the standard that is proposed in this legislation. Uh, so with one policy, we can reduce our contribution to the global climate crisis, we can improve air quality in the most disproportionately impacted communities in our state, and we can grow jobs and grow rural economies in the parts of our state that have often been left behind by our economic prowess. Um, there's not that many policies that we get to consider in the Washington State Legislature that achieve all three of those aims at once. And so um, I'm very excited to be bringing back this legislation again in the 2021 session. Uh, and I'm feeling more confident than ever that this is the year that we will actually get this bill all the way to Governor Inslee's desk. Uh, thank you, Joe, and thanks for your leadership. And I want to note you've already had major successes, the best 100 percent clean grid bill in the country, the best energy efficiency standards, and it's a large part because of your leadership. With that, I'd like to ask Mark Riker, the executive secretary of the Washington State Building and Construction Trades Council, to address this. Mark, I really appreciate you being here today. Thank you, Mr. Governor, for the opportunity to join you today. It should come as no surprise to anyone that you are continuing to take progressive action to issues affecting the environment. You've had a very successful career, and in fact, just got elected to a historic third term as governor of Washington State, with that as a primary focus of your administration. It has long been the belief that issues that benefit the environment are detrimental to the traditional middle-class family wage multi-generational careers in the building trades and other fossil fuel related industries. By including us in the thorough process of policy development, you are showing a commitment to breaking down those misunderstandings and making sure that the very folks the whole planet have relied, on, relied upon for generations are not left behind. As these policies progress through the legislative process, 
you can be assured that the building trades and all of our affiliates will be working diligently to ensure that the hardworking men and women of Washington State are leading the way, creating opportunities to continue those middle-class family wage careers. We're very appreciative that you are including us in these difficult efforts, and we look forward to the challenging work ahead. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Thanks for your leadership on this. We know that you represent a lot of people who are going to have great jobs because of this, and I hope they'll give you that credit uh, when that comes. Uh, now I'd like to turn to Kent Hardwick, who's Director of Corporate Affairs for the Renewable Energy Group. Kent. Governor Ainsley, thank you for your ongoing support of the renewable fuel industry and for your steadfast advocacy for a clean fuel standard in Washington. Renewable Energy Group is North America's largest biodiesel producer and a leading producer of renewable diesel. Our production process converts waste fats, oils, greases, and vegetable oils into a high quality renewable fuel to meet the growing global demand for cleaner and lower carbon products. And we're proud to say that the use of our products in a conventional diesel engine result in a substantial reduction in the number of unburned hydrocarbons, carbon monoxide, sulfur, and particulate matter that um, Representative Fitzgibbon was talking about. REG also operates the largest biodiesel production facility in the West Coast. It's located in Hopewell, in Washington. Now, REG Grace Harbor is an incredible facility with exceptional employees, 41 actually, um, and the plant supports approximately 800 other indirect jobs in the community. REG's innovative production capabilities, excellent production specification, and deep water port location for serving the Western United States and Canada positions REG for a very bright future and as an asset in the state of Washington. But the reality is biodiesel currently represents less than 1% of the Washington fuel stream. Even while the largest biodiesel plant in the West Coast is located in its borders, about 15% of our fuel produced at Grace Harbor is consumed in state. The rest goes to markets that have adopted biodiesel within their carbon reduction strategies. They're realizing the true value of our fuel more than Washington. And these are markets that have a clean fuel standard, markets like what Governor Inslee has announced the support for. And a clean fuel standard locally means we can invest in our plant, grow, and expand, knowing there's a supportive market close by to sell our fuel into, one that appreciates the renewable, low-carbon, pollution-reducing benefits we provide. And renewable fuel is just one economic sector that will be creating jobs in Washington State under a clean fuel standard. Hydrogen, electric vehicles, forest mass biofuels, and other clean fuel types can make Washington the leader of the clean economy on the West Coast. We can continue to invest in our REG Grays Harbor facility to improve production levels, efficiencies, and continue to safety improvements. But there's more that we can do. Passing this legislation sends the signal that Washington is open for business, and it's a green business. I know our employees appreciate the economic benefits the plant brings to Grays Harbor. But the local economic impact of the plant pales in comparison to the environmental benefits. Washington has received few environmental benefits from this facility. And it's time to change that. It's time to deliver what Washington deserves, which is homegrown renewable fuels. So thank you, Representative Fitzgibbon, for the inspiration. Thank you, Senator Carlisle, for standing strong on building a renewable future. And thank you, Governor Inslee, for your never-ending leadership to support a clean fuel future. Uh, thank you, Kent. Thanks for your hardworking people. We want to bring those uh, benefits home to Washington. I also just want to say I'm glad that you are willing to compete, but we need you to compete with other fuel producers fairly. And right now it's not fair to you because your competitors are putting gigatons of pollution into the air. They're not paying anything for it in unlimited amounts. You're providing benefits of not putting those uh, pollutants in the air. That's not a fair level playing field. So the fact that you are willing to be courageous while we level this playing field, I really appreciate it. And I, I hope we're gonna get this done. I believe that we will. So thank you, uh, 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 fellas. Uh, this year, we have more to work to do clearly beyond transportation. We know that our legislature passed a bill to update our greenhouse gas limits that was consistent with the most recent science. Now we need to hold ourselves accountable to those limits. We know that a clean energy transition that meets our greenhouse gas limits is projected to create an additional 6,700 construction jobs by 2030. 
and around 31,000 construction jobs by 2050. And for those reasons and more, I'm proposing the Climate Containment, excuse me, Climate Commitment Act, which would put a price on carbon by putting a cap on carbon emissions from the largest emitters in our state. This bill would give the Department of Ecology the authority to administer a program to ensure that covered industries meet the cap through auction of emission allowances. Now, this is important. Proceeds from the emissions allowances will fund critical green infrastructure, putting people to work. Uh, will fund climate resilience to try to prevent the horrendous forest fires and forest management to prevent what happened to Malden this summer and clean energy programs in our state. And priority in these expenditures will go to benefit communities that now are the most impacted by environmental uh, pollution to bring in an added uh, environmental justice to this effort. This legislation includes provisions to incorporate environmental justice and equity, including allowing uh, a portion of these revenues to fund the Working Families Tax Credit. Now, the Working Families Tax Credit was approved by the legislature in 2008, but it's never been funded. And this would provide uh, essentially uh, benefits for low and moderate income families to help them through these troubled times in an economy that is grossly inequitable. So this plan will help create jobs, reduce pollution, increase uh, investment in critical infrastructure, and help families uh, through these troubled times. Because it is clear we are already grappling with the increasing costs of climate impacts, the Act will ensure our state has a strategic and coordinated approach to climate resilience. We want to reduce the biggest uh, impacts for the most vulnerable communities and ecosystems, and this will help us target and vector in these investments so we get the biggest bang for our buck. So to talk more about this piece of our package, we're joined by Senator Reuven Carlisle, who's been a uh, tremendous leader in the Senate for years on these subjects. Senator. Thanks so much, Governor. It's such a pleasure to be with you and my colleague, uh, Representative Fitzgibbon, my gracious colleague, Senator Saldana, will join us. You know, you're absolutely right. In 2019, the legislature took a bold step forward in terms of reducing emissions in, uh, in the electricity sector, just the strongest 100% clean energy bill in the nation. But here's the thing. It's also the one bill that the industry, the utilities were able to support, and they were able to support it because it was measured it was responsible, it was thoughtful, and it was proportional. And that's really the guiding theme moving forward with an economy-wide strategy. You've talked a lot about transportation sector and how critical that is to our overall emission reductions. But as you said, we also raised the bar and raised the standard and raised the goal to try to meet uh, Paris Accord level reductions in emissions in the years ahead and get to what we call a net zero, sort of eliminate 95% of our emissions by the year 2050. So this is the work plan. This is the homework. This is the real deal part of that work plan that allows us to roll up our sleeves together to reduce emissions by 2030, by 2040 and 2050, all in a responsible and a measured work plan that allows our agriculture and our timber and our manufacturing and so many other sectors to go along at the right pace for that works for them that is proportional and that is very focused on the sensitivity issue of cost and the needs for reliability and other investments that the people of our state really uh, support and really need. Uh, you know, we talked about global best practices in science. You talked about global best practices in industry partnerships. Some of the premier companies in the world have made the very same commitment to carbon emission reductions that we in Washington state have and some other states around the country are trying to move forward as well. So the question is how to partner, how to do this in a responsible way. What it means is that we have to actually reduce emissions. And that means that we have to have a measured cap that generates revenue for high quality, high impact investments in clean jobs and clean energy, uh, in important parts of our transportation system in terms of electrification. But it has to be done in a way that captures the essence of environmental justice and equity at its soul. The issue of environmental justice and equity is not a footnote. 
It's not a department down the hall. It is central to this work. We're going to do this in a way that we lift up our, our entire, entire state together. together. The, seven the seven million, million people of our state state rural areas and small towns are just as much of a partner as the city and just as much of a partner as our communities of color and all the communities that are uh, such a part of the fabric of this state. So this legislation is modeled on some of the best practices from some of the Nordic countries, some of the best practices and lessons learned and some of the painful lessons in California and other places. So what we're trying to do is cap these emissions and slowly, responsibly ratchet those down in a way that works economically as part of our economic rebuilding plan from the COVID-19 pandemic. So I'm excited to partner with you. I believe the ingredients of a strong partnership are there between the House and the Senate and the governor's office. And as we build on the foundation of the 100% clean energy bill and so much of the other legislation we passed, this is our time to reduce emissions in a really meaningful way, in a way that has equity and social justice as its core, in a way that recognizes the importance of strong labor standards, and in the way that does it that works with our partners uh, in the industry and the private sector in a responsible, measured way so we can all get to 2050 together in a way that uh, captures the very best of our climate action. Thanks, Governor. Looking forward to partnering with you. Thanks, Ruben. Thanks for your leadership. I do want to note one central thing about this uh, proposal. It limits pollution. It has a legally enforceable cap, as that word would suggest, which is uh, the fundamental goal of this effort. And it is an important part of this package. Uh, so we know we are pro-jobs, we are pro-health, but we are also pro-justice. And that's why this last session, the legislature in my office established the Environmental Justice Task Force to develop recommendations to better serve the least represented folks in our state. And those who are most impacted in the communities that have been living with the harmful effects of pollution for decades. We know that climate change imperils uh, human health in many ways. We know that we, uh, the impact of not having access to clean air is profound. The epidemic of asthma that our children are suffering, uh, the, the respiratory and cardiac problems associated with breathing dirty, toxic, filled air is a horrible thing. And there's no reason that we should have to live with dirty air. We're, we're better than this. We have the technology to prevent this. We know that we need safe drinking water and nutritious food. So my proposals incorporate recommendations from the Environmental Justice Task Force, including the creation of the Environmental Justice and Equity Panel to advise us in designing and implementing climate policies and funding climate investments to ensure that we meet our goals for, for environmental justice and environmental equity. So every investment will have to undergo the environmental justice analysis to make sure that they answer to this value. I'm also proposing to fund several staff and programs focused on environmental justice in key agencies, including the Department of Ecology and Commerce, the Department of Natural Resources. So going forward, uh, I'm looking forward to working uh, with the legislature and we have a leader in the legislature, Senator Rebecca, uh, Rebecca Saldana, uh, who has hap helped pass the Healthy Environment for All Act. And I just can't think of a better leader in the legislature to make sure we embrace environmental justice in all its respects, who is a fierce advocate and an effective advocate for environmental justice. Senator, could you share your thoughts? Thank you so much, Governor. And it's an honor to be with all of you here today. And as we speak about the importance of environmental justice, I want to recognize our sovereign nations and your leadership also in creating a powerful and correct um, sovereign nation consultation with our tribal um, partners here in Washington State who have been the true leaders uh, and stewards of what it means to lead um, in a way that addresses our climate and, the, and our salmon and our natural resources in a responsible way that is centered at the local level, at the people level. And so I um, want to give gratitude both for all our sovereign nations that continue to teach us and work with us and partner with us as we move forward with this uh, proposal that's before us today. 
because I have come to know as a daughter of a farm worker, as a daughter of a a factory worker in our Duwamish Superfund um, that has worked and, and provided for me and allowed me this opportunity to be with you before you as a state senator, as a legislator, and as a colleague. It was because of his sacrifice and because of the good job, the union job that he had, but it was also a carbon intensive job. And, um, and the Duwamish, the South Park communities that have a, a lower life expectancy than folks just across the other side of our Lake Washington um, want those good jobs. And so a just transition is something that I know is very much embedded in how we think about a work plan and how we get um, that transition to clean fuels because environmental and racial justice is the way that we achieve our climate goals and make them last and make them persistent um, and allow our youth and our next generation to be able to benefit and take ownership and stewardship of this new way and this new economy. And so I am so thankful for the leadership of making sure that we embed and center environmental justice in statute um, which is what this proposal includes. And that, that what we are looking at is a three-part area a plan that does put a cap on um, our pollution, that um, centers communities being at the table to help shape how that process and how we implement, including our labor partners and that puts strategic investments in an economic recovery focused on just transition and green infrastructure. That these are core elements that allow us to both lead with our values, but also uh, make sure that we're meeting those values with true outcomes um, centered on environmental justice. So I will be looking forward to the hard work that this will require under this virtual setting um, as we are trying to connect with people, have people feel heard and listened to, and still make sure that we deliver a package of proposals that are going to meet our needs um, centered on environmental justice. Senator, thank you. And I'm confident you're gonna be a stalwart force in this effort. So I'm looking forward to this next session with you. We also have a tribal leader, uh, Chair Leonard Forsman of the Suquamish Tribe. Uh, Mr. Chair, thank you for joining us today. You have been uh, uh, such a great environmental champion in so many different ways. I'm glad you're willing to share time with us. Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you for the honor, Governor, and thank you for all your work with the tribes through your first two terms. I'm looking forward to more in the third term. And we just concluded our um, Centennial Accord where natural resources were a major part of that discussion and this dovetails into those further discussions. Uh, I'd like to uh, open with a, some, just a sentence or two from an ancestral leader of ours, uh, Chief Seattle, who lives, who lived and died here in Suquamish on the Port Madison Indian Reservation. And he, when he opened his speech in 1854, uh, it was rather prophetic when he was talking to Governor Stevens. Um, before the treaties were signed. Yonder sky that has wept tears of compassion on our fathers for centuries untold, and which to us appears changeless and internal, may change. Today it is fair, tomorrow it may be overcast with clouds. And uh, a lot of his speeches and writings have been prophetic. And um, I think that that's a point that you recognized uh, decades ago and continue to work on. And we appreciate that. As you know, the Suquamish and other tribes of Sales Sea, the Columbia River and the coast rely on marine life for our um, cultural, spiritual, economic, uh, ceremonial lives and way of life. And uh, we really are very concerned about the climate, the impacts of climate change on those, among other impacts that we've been working on for decades uh, to try to reverse. And um, we were really concerned uh, about these impacts on our treaty resources. And um, we're very concerned that if things continue as they have, um, that we will have suffer ocean acidification um, and uh, warming waters and all these things that will impact our um, our way of life and those uh, marine resources, those animals, those plants, those medicines, all those things that we've relied on for a long time and have a commitment to pass on to future generations. And these impacts threaten our spiritual kin, the Southern Resident Killer Whales as well. 
And as I've said before, they ask for the same commitments from us and the, and the people that uh, live here in Washington um, that we've been asking as tribes for, for decades as well. And that's more salmon, uh, clean water, free of toxics, and reduced vessel traffic. So we really appreciate um, the um, senators and Cong uh, House people um, in the legislature that have spoken earlier and their commitment over uh, for the future uh, legislate, uh, legislative session and also the work they've done in the past uh, to um, have some meaningful climate action. And uh, we really look forward to that and we really uh, want to maintain some of those main major uh, commitments uh, that we've uh, discussed in the past, including set asides for a lot of the projects that uh, the tribes have identified that will restore Puget Sound and restore our ecosystems. And um, we look forward to working with the governor and the legislature on making sure that those commitments are met and that we can all meet our um, respective um, commitment to the next seven generations. So on behalf of the Suquamish tribe and the affiliated tribes of Northwest Indians, uh, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to speak on behalf of the, the tribal nations of Washington. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks for your leadership. I just want to note that I'm glad you brought up fishing. It is the tribal communities obviously have an ancestral uh, right to fishing, but I want to note uh, everybody's fishing. You know, you drive around Western Washington, every fifth house has a trailer with a 20-foot fishing boat on it. And it's a lot more fun to have fish in the water you can actually catch. And that's what's at stake right here. The survival of our salmon runs and our fishing for everybody is at risk right now, terrible risk because of carbon pollution. And I want to thank you and other tribal leaders for helping everybody on this. Um, so, but I'd like to talk about some investments as well. To support our ongoing transition to a more just and equitable clean energy economy, we uh, believe investment makes sense. So I am proposing investing $100 million in projects that provide a public benefit through the development, the demonstration, and deployment of clean energy technologies from our Clean Energy Fund. In priority when we do this, it must be a, a clearly on vulnerable populations and overburdened communities, including uh, uh, communities with high environmental and energy burdens and tribes. This makes sense. This also includes $15 million for grid modernization projects that support the integration of renewable energy sources, and $15 million for research and development of clean energy technologies, $20 million for electrifying our transportation system, $20 million for clean buildings and electrification projects, and another $20 million for small businesses, for nonprofits and homeowners and multifamily housing to help reduce their energy operating costs through energy efficiency. Again, these investments mean jobs. Uh, residential and commercial buildings account for one-fifth of our state's greenhouse gas emissions. So we have some more work to do in this realm as well. In order to meet our greenhouse gas limits, we need to make sure that our new buildings are constructed away where they don't waste energy, which is money just going out the window, so they're more efficient and they use the cleanest equipment that's available. So this means eliminating fossil fuel use for space and water heating and using high efficiency electric appliances. We also need to retrofit existing buildings to be cleaner and more efficient. Therefore, I'm proposing a bill to eliminate fossil fuels from new and residential commercial construction for space and water heating uh, by 2030 and to put the state on a pathway to eliminate the use of fossil fuels from existing buildings by 2050. Uh, by the way, this would not eliminate range top uh, natural gas. We know people enjoy that, and that would be allowed under our proposal. This proposal funds programs to help with electrification of space and water heating, and it authorizes public utilities to provide incentives for high efficiency uh, electric equipment. We also invest $140 million to support energy efficiency and electrification of 7,000 low-income residences in our state, energy retrofits for more than 200 public buildings, and support for the next generation of clean buildings. And I think you can see this is going to generate a lot of work for a lot of people with hammers. And we think that's a good thing. Uh, so we had a breakdown here.
These proposals together represent a half billion dollars toward improving health and the environment and creating thousands of jobs. Now, today I had uh, kind of a fun, maybe it isn't a total coincidence, but today I got to cut the virtual ribbon on the Rattlesnake Flat Wind Farm in Adams County. This was so exciting to, to, to see over 70 wind turbines that are going to produce energy enough for 38,000 homes with virtually no carbon pollution. And seeing those wind turbines realize they're spinning out perfectly clean electricity, no pollution. Each one of them represents jobs. This is 250 permanent jobs in Adam County and who knows how many in the construction process. I looked at those wind turbines and monuments to our future and monuments to our commitment to our state and to our grandchildren. And we know that we can meet our 100% clean electrical uh, grid bill by embracing projects like this because they're really happening. This is not a pipe dream. You can't turn over a rock in Washington state without finding a clean energy project today. In Spokane, where cross laminated timber is a world-class new resource to reduce carbon intensity. In Lind, where I got to go to the ribbon cutting for a, a large solar farm also in that county. Uh, in Bellingham, where a large, one of the largest manufacturers of solar panels in the Western Hemisphere. In Vancouver, where I remember I was flying down to Vancouver and I looked down and see all these wind turbine blades, which are just incredibly huge. If you're ever sitting next to one, it'll blow your socks off. And those mean longshoremen jobs and trucking jobs delivering these, these projects. We have clean energy sprouting all over the state of Washington. And now we just need to be a little more ambitious to put those people to work as fast as we can. So I'm looking forward to this session. We got uh, a very ambitious state, but we're just ambitious enough and we're confident enough to get this job done. With that, happy to stand for your questions, as will the other speakers. We'll go to Rachel LaCour with AP. Go ahead, Rachel. Governor, ideas like the clean fuel standard have stalled in the legislature before. The numbers haven't changed over there. So why do you think you'll have any better luck with these measures now? A lot of good reasons. We're not daunted that not everything has been done yet. We have passed really major legislation, the best clean energy electrical grid bill in the United States the best energy efficiency bill in the United States, the greenest transportation policy. So we've made real progress. But what has changed is now the, the repercussions, the immediate harm and danger is now becoming every, every year more apparent to Washingtonians and they're crying out for action. But this is not a hypothetical issue to me. This is looking into the homeowners in Malden whose home burned down. I remember meeting a family that they were lucky, they were at somebody else's house when their home burned down, three kids, beautiful kids. But seeing what it's done to their life, that's a real thing to me. Talking to a mother whose kid couldn't go outside and play two, two out of three summers, the last summers in, 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 in Bellevue, for goodness sakes. This is a real thing and people are desperate and demanding action from their legislators and that's becoming more and more apparent. That's number one. Number two, at the very same time, the economic benefits are becoming more and more apparent every year. More jobs are being created. You know, people used to scoff at this 10 years ago. People scoffed at the idea of wind turbines in Adam County. Now they're getting money from those jobs and they understand it's a real life thing. Uh, you know, and, and the technology is now becoming available. Shoot, they're building an electric Hummer. You know, when I saw a commercial for an electric Hummer which sort of epitomized a particular way of looking at transportation. I knew this is a real thing. Ford, the ad I saw last night was saying Ford has existed for over, I don't know, 100 years because it changes. And it said, we are changing to an electric car platform company. They realize this change is coming. So this is a something that has been internalized uh, in our in our thinking of our possibilities in the state of Washington. A third, we've had some new members of the legislature show up and every one of those new members, at least on the Democratic side, are fully committed 
and moving the ball on climate change, and it's one of the reasons uh, they were re-elected. Re and fourth, uh, I'm intent in leading this effort, and we're not done with this yet. So I feel very confident about progress this year, and I'm looking forward to signing some good bills. Uh, would any of the senators or representatives want to add anything to that? Uh, sure, I'll jump in. Thanks, Governor. Uh, I really appreciate it because I think it is a I think it is a spot on question, and I think a lot has changed. Uh, as you said, uh, uh, all of our colleagues who uh, ran for re-election talked about climate change not as a department down the hall, but as something that's central to their passion, their work plan, their policy belief, and their political priorities. It is an absolute, unequivocal priority of the Senate Democratic Caucus to pass this package. We are strongly in favor of meaningful climate action. I think the votes are there. We've made some important improvements in how we uh, manage our internal process. That's gonna allow us to move forward as well. And I think that there's a growing consensus uh, given the progress that we had in the last two years when we took progress on 100% clean energy and hydrofluorocarbons and building standards, a whole bunch of uh, steps. It went well, and it went well because we worked together and we listened closely uh, to the full range of stakeholders and uh, the community and public. And so I think that experience has gone well, and I think people are ready to step up to the plate and join uh, our, uh, our our governor in this work. And uh, and I think we have the votes to move this forward. Yes, I may add too. Uh, you know, the the citizens had a choice this year in a in one race in the governor's race. They had a candidate who made it clear that he believed that clean energy was a job creator. And we had a candidate who believed that this was all just kind of a hoax and we shouldn't do anything about climate change. You know, and they selected the candidate by over 500,000 votes. And that's a decision they made. Now I realize the New York Jets have caused, called for a recount of the last game against the Hawks, uh, but that recount isn't gonna change that central situation. Rachel, did you want to ask a follow-up question? Related to Washington healthcare workers receiving COVID vaccine today, Governor, your office has said that you'll wait your turn based on age to receive it, but have officials at DOH given you a sense on when people in your age group will be eligible to be vaccinated? Uh, no, uh, those priority decisions have not been made. We're waiting to see some recommendations from the CDC federally. And so those decisions have not been made. Uh, the decisions may be more uh, acute than just age. They may involve comorbidities. They may involve uh, particular job classifications. And those are gonna be very challenging decisions, frankly, but they have not been made yet. And I appreciate what I'm hearing from Washingtonians so far, which is to be thrilled that we're having this vaccine in our community and realizing now that we have an opportunity to help the vaccine by protecting ourselves while we're waiting uh, uh, for the vaccine for our families. And so far I get this feeling from Washingtonians that they're willing to do everything they can to protect themselves while, while we're waiting for our, our, our turn in this prioritization process. All right, up next we'll go to Joe Sullivan with the Seattle Times. Go ahead, Joe. Governor, your proposal to cap carbon emissions here, is this um, closer to your um, cap and trade ideas from a few years ago, or is this more geared uh, like the, your, uh, the authority you sought um, to impose these through executive powers last year? Well, there are multiple parts of this package, but the, pack, the part that has a cap on carbon and invest those revenues in a number of things are similar to things I've proposed in the past. I think that this has been significantly altered though with a much more robust, intentional, and focused uh, priority for environmental justice. And we have, that has been a very conscious decision. Uh, we've learned from the California experience. We've, we've built on it. We've made it better by embracing much more, uh, more intentional environmental justice measures. So. It's a much improved product, and I'm, I'm pleased that our Environmental Justice Task Force helped me in that regard. Joe, did you want to ask a follow-up question? Yeah, Governor, today WITEC uh, acknowledged known security vulnerabilities in the IT system since it uses uh, SolarWinds uh, software, which the feds have um, 
advise people to shut down uh, after hacking exposure. What's your understanding of the extent of exposure to Washington's IT systems to uh, this program? Uh, we'll have to give you more specifics on that to give you an acute answer. Obviously, we have concerns, as people do across the United States. But, Joe, uh, to give you a more uh, extensive answer, let me get, get back to you talking to our folks. Go to Jim Camden from the Spokesman Review. Go ahead, Jim. Governor, I'm wondering how much do you anticipate the uh, carbon emissions uh, allowance caps and, and, and the money raising for projects, and, and how much do you expect coming in for the for the work uh, working families tax credits from the from your plan? I don't have those dollar figures off the top of my head. Now it's important to note the working the, the revenue that would be generated through the cap and invest plan would be distributed in a variety of, of ways, not just the working uh, families tax credit. So there is a portion that go for multiple buckets that are for reducing carbon, for investing in job creation, and for bringing more environmental justice, including the, the, the Working Families Tax Credit. So I don't have a dollar figure. If we can generate one, I will try to get it to you. I'm pleased about the Working Family Tax Credit, though, because we know about the inequities of our society that have become even more pronounced. And this was passed by the legislature, but never funded. So this would be a way to start funding this to reduce some of the horrendous inequities we have in our, in our society that have become more pronounced, frankly, because of the COVID pandemic. Uh, you know, the people who've been hit so hard in the lower end of the scale, who've, who've lost their jobs, this is the right time for this investment. Jim, did you want to ask a follow-up question? Yeah, uh, on, on the carbon emissions caps, there, there's been some controversy over the years of, of what companies are on those caps and various sizes. And uh, it, do you have a list yet of, of, of the companies that would, would be on that, to, uh, on those caps? You know, I don't know if we have a list. We've had ones in the past. I will provide in future weeks a, a more acute description of those, and we're happy to do that uh, when we have that. I may note that we were also designed this in a way that will not make us uncompetitive from a trade perspective. We're alert to that. We're going to keep jobs here in the state of Washington. I'm confident of that. All right. Up next, we'll go to Sarah Gensler with McClatchy. Go ahead, Sarah. All right. This is for Senator Carlisle or Governor Inslee. Um, similar to what Jim just asked, um, can you give us an idea of what industries broadly uh, the cap would go, uh, would go to effect for? Ruben, you want to take that and I'll follow up? Sure. Well, I mean, the goal is to have sort of a thoughtful economy-wide approach. At the same time, we've made meaningful progress on a couple of different sectors, most notably in the electricity sector. So they, they've got sort of a really strong decarbonization strategy for a lot of electricity. So we're looking at a variety of sectors, and we're trying to figure out how we make sure that it's multidisciplinary across them and make sure also that it's proportional. So we're not asking any one company or any one industry or any one sector to do more than its fair share. We're just trying to get the math right and work with them to make sure that it's proportional, the types of emission reductions that we want them to see. So our goal is a broader base so that everybody's contributing their fair share in a measured way. So that's the, that's the details uh, that we'll be uh, uh, unleashing in the next uh, in the next week or so. Still working on some of those, but I think you'll find that it's pretty balanced relative to uh, the variety of disciplines that we need to touch on. If I may note, too, the, the, the thought pattern behind our state strategy is that there's no one silver bullet when you're fighting climate change. Uh, the communities that have had success on this have had multiple strategies to attack this problem on multiple fronts, and that's what we're doing here because each policy has a particular strength and we, we've got to use several of them to actually get down to our climate goals. And I may know too, is that we've, look, we've created a legal obligation by the state of Washington to reduce climate emissions. It's binding on the state of Washington. Now we've got to really put to, uh, to practice the tools to get it done. We are not about empty promises to the people of the state of Washington. So this is what this effort's about. 
right, Sarah, did you want to ask a follow-up question? So um, in the press release that went out that mentions the cap and invest program created by the Climate Commitment Act, uh, it includes transportation fuel suppliers as maybe one of the industries this might impact. And I'm curious if by including them in the legislation, it might intensify the pushback on the low carbon fuel standard uh, proposal, or do you see these as working in tandem to address emissions in transportation? Well, they can work in tandem very well because that's happening in California where there's been considerable success while still having a very, very vigorous economy. So there's no reason uh, that should not be the case. All right. I think we've got time for one more question. We'll go to John Ryan with KUOW. Go ahead, John. John, are you there? Yeah, mute, John. Like we are not able to hear. No. Oh, there we go. No. Go ahead, John. My, my, my apologies, everybody. Uh, Governor, you often talk about the smoke from climate fires. Um, if Washington and others stop using fossil fuels, how soon can we expect forest fire smoke to get better? Well, uh, listen, the truth is that this is a global problem, and uh, fires in our state, including grass and sage fires, are caused by a global problem, which is carbon dioxide and methane pollution. And it is a reality that no one family or business or state or city or country or continent can solve this problem alone. So the answer to the question depends on all of us doing our part to reduce carbon emissions, to reduce the change in the climate that we're experiencing. And so we're going to do our part uh, to do that, as we expect everyone in, in, the, in, the, in the human family to do that. Thankfully, they are. You know, I'm glad that we've rejoined the Paris Agreement because the entire rest of the world was part of that effort. So we've all got to pull on the rope. The sooner we do that, the sooner we'll change our forest conditions. But I must tell you that our forests, because of the existing climate change we've already seen, together with the density of our forests, we are probably in for this for years, if not decades, to come. And that is one reason we need to do management of our forests more intensely. And that is why we, in our budget, we're putting increased dollars in for management of our forests as well, is one of the things we can do to reduce the fire risk. But it cannot eliminate it, in part because a lot of these fires are grass and sagebrush fires, they're not forest fires. So I regrettably have to tell you, there's no instant relief here. But uh, as been said, if, if something takes a long time, it's better to start working on that the next year, because it'll make it a little less long time. John, did you want to ask a follow-up question? Yeah, thank you. Um, how are aviation emissions addressed in your package of policies? Uh, we have uh, uh, an appropriate phase, if you will, and we think that it's uh, going to be successful in driving the use of renewable fuel. And that's why in the past we've had support for some folks in the uh, aerospace industry, because it will help create a renewable fuels industry. And the avi aviation industry is committed. They know this is a they're men and women of science. They understand how terrible climate change is. So they know that we have to find some reduction in our emissions from aviation. So we have had quite a few uh, voices uh, in aviation that have supported the clean fuel standard because it will drive the creation of a biofuels industry and then they can buy biofuels for their jets and reduce their emissions uh, as, because biofuels have a less emission uh, platform. So we think it is a positive thing for the avi aviation industry because they know they have to find a way to reduce uh, emissions. Um, I wonder if our friend could address that issue about uh, biofuels as well. Um, I if think you'd like to. Fitzgibbon was hoping to comment. Yeah, Joe, you had so one you know, say something? You know, Mike, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll try to help with that one. Um, you know, we've seen very strong support over the last several years, several years from the Port of Seattle um, for clean fuel standard legislation. And that's really driven by their interest in developing low carbon pathways for aviation fuels. Um, you know, under federal law, 
we as a state cannot directly regulate the carbon content of aviation fuel, um, but we can provide the incentives to scale up the industries that, that will supply aviation biofuels as, rel as well as on-road biofuels. Uh, and that's why we've seen such robust support from the Port of Seattle for this industry um, and why the biofuel industry, uh, pr refiners of biofuels are not just producing on-road fuels, they're producing on-road fuels as well as other distillates, including aviation fuels. Um, and so we really need to scale up the on-road fuel industry, biofuel industry in order to provide that anchor market um, to allow them to also expand into producing aviation biofuels. And that's, um, I think it's, there's a pretty strong consensus in the aviation industry that um, electrification of, of airplanes is not imminent and that we're really going to need biofuels for sustainable aviation um, for the several decades to come. And that's why a policy like a clean fuel standard for on-road fuels is so critical for the aviation sector. Do you have any closing remarks? Uh, no, I wanna thank uh, everybody on this call who's working on this issue. Uh, we've come a long ways, but we've got, we've got more journeying to do. And I'm looking forward to this session because I think the, the stage is set for another example of Washington State leading the world to a better economy and a healthier state of Washington. And I believe we're gonna get that done this year. Uh, please be well, take care of your health.